Okay, today is the 13th of September. And we've come to Majjhima Nikaya Sutta number 10, Satipatthana Sutta. Thus have I heard, on one occasion the Blessed One was living in the Kuru country at a town of the Kurus named Kamasadama. There he addressed the monks thus, Monks, Venerable Sir, they replied, the Blessed One said, Monks, this is the direct path for the purification of beings, for the surmounting of sorrow and lamentation, for the disappearance of pain and grief, for the attainment of the true way, for the realization of Nibbana, namely the four Satipatthanas. I'll stop here for a moment. Eh? This, uh, this is the direct path, this is the translation here. The Pali is Ekayana Mago, a path that leads one way only, Jalan Sahala, uh, one way path. Uh, so in other words, uh, it only leads you uh, to the uh, disappearance of Dukkha, uh, only leads you to the realization, realization of Nibbana. Uh, and these four Satipatthana, I like to translate it as the four intense states of sati. Uh, the reason can be found in my book, uh, Mindfulness, Recollection and Concentration. Uh, sati, the meaning of sati is recollection. You can translate it as mindfulness, but it is not general mindfulness. It is a specific mindfulness uh, directed only to four objects, uh, the body, feelings, the mind and Dhamma. Um, so if you use the word mindfulness, uh, sometimes people get, get the wrong idea. Like people think it's general mindfulness. It is not general mindfulness. Uh. So the word recollection is better because recollection means uh, recalling, uh, bringing to mind uh, only four objects, uh, paying attention uh, to only four objects, uh, being mindful of only four objects. Uh, uh. What are the four? Here monks, a monk abides contemplating the body. Here it says as a body. Other places it says uh, in the body. I think in the new translation by this Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi uh, of the Sangyutta Nikaya, he puts the body in the body. But the best translation probably is Venerable Tanisa Rose. Uh, abides contemplating the body uh, in and of itself. Uh, contemplates the body in and of itself. Mm. So the idea is that uh, he contemplates the body uh, in the body, uh, not among thoughts and among other uh, other things. Uh, that means fully focused on the body. Uh. But it's contemplating the body in the body, ardent, fully aware and uh, collected. Uh. He's fully aware and collected, Sati Sampajanya. Having put away covetousness and grief for the world, he abides contemplating feelings and feelings, ardent, fully aware, collected, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. He abides contemplating mind in the mind, ardent, fully aware, collected, having put, put away covetousness and grief for the world. He abides contem contemplating Dhamma, in Dhamma, ardent, fully aware, collected, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. Um, so here the four satipatthanas means uh, contemplating these four objects, uh, the body, feelings, mind and dhamma uh, in and of itself, uh, mm, fully focused uh, on these four things uh, or one of these four. Uh, uh, having put away covetousness and grief for the world, uh, I think I explained uh, uh, several nights ago, uh, that means uh, Having put away uh, um, the world, uh, because if you chase after worldly objects, uh, either you have covetousness, you want to cover them, uh, you want to possess them, or if you can't get them, uh, then you have grief. Uh, so if you don't want to have these two unwholesome states of covetousness and grief, uh, then uh, you don't want to you put away the world, uh, you let go of the world, let go of worldly enjoyments. Uh, 
and how monks just a monk abide contemplating the body in the body here a monk gone to the forest or to the root of a tree or to an empty hut sits down having folded his legs crosswise set his body erect and established mindfulness in front of him ever mindful he breathes in mindful he breathes out stop here for a moment na established mindfulness in front of him uh, that day i mentioned uh, that means uh, if you set up something in front of you you can only see it, uh, you don't see any other thing uh, so uh you who set up mindfulness in front of you uh, you are only aware of mindfulness uh, you are not aware of any other thing so <coughs> breathing in long he understands i breathe in long or breathing out long he understands i breathe out long breathing in short he understands i breathe i breathe in short or breathing out short he understands i breathe out short he trains thus i shall experience i shall breathe in experiencing the whole body of the breath he trains thus i shall breathe out experiencing the whole body he trains thus i shall breathe in tranquilizing the body conditioner <coughs> he trains thus I shall breathe out tranquilizing the body conditioner saya sakaya sankara just as a skilled turner or his apprentice when making a long turn understands i make a long turn or when making a short turn understands i make a short turn so too breathing in long a monk understands i breathe in long etc uh, so here when the breath is long he knows uh, he notices that it is long like the breath is short he notices that it is it is short like and then he breathes in and out uh, experiencing the body like. the body is the breath body like mm-hmm. it's not the physical body it's a breath body like and then he again he says as a breathe in tranquilizing the body conditioner the body conditioner is also the breath like because um the body conditioner the body depends uh, on breath to survive la. without the breath uh, the body cannot survive la. Uh, so the body conditioner refers to the breath la. Mm. so as he continues uh, observing the breath uh, then the the breath becomes more and more tranquilized la. becomes calmer becomes uh, uh, um no tranquil and then uh just like an apprentice uh, he notices uh, whether it's a long breath or short breath etc mm. in this way he abides contemplating the body in the body internally or he abides contemplating the the body in the body externally or he abides contemplating the body in the body both internally and externally or else he abides contemplating in the body its arising factors or he abides contemplating in the body its vanishing factors or he abides contemplating in the body both its arising and vanishing factors or else mindfulness that there is a body is simply established in him to the extent necessary for bare knowledge and mindfulness or collectedness and he abides independent not clinging to anything in the world that is how a monk abides contemplating the body in the body mm. he abides independent uh, not clinging to anything in the world uh, uh, because if he clings to anything in the world uh, then the unwholesome states of covetousness and grief arise uh. so when he practices the holy path uh, he lets go of things in the world uh. is very important uh, otherwise uh, you cannot progress in the spiritual path a lot of people want to practice a spiritual path but still uh, cannot let go la, so they cannot make much progress la, uh. and then this uh, arising factors uh, refers to the uh, conditions uh, that cause its arising uh, uh, the uh, factors that cause the origination uh, of the body here referring to the breath body or uh the conditions is vanishing factors refers to the uh factors uh, for its ceasing uh, or its vanishing uh. then the body in uh internally is uh, the our own body uh, externally is the external bodies uh. mm. yeah 
Here in this in this uh, case, uh, we are talking about the breath body, uh, but uh, this body can refer to any body. Uh, can be the physical body also. Again, monks, when walking, a monk understands, I am walking. When standing, he understands, I am standing. When sitting, he understands, I am sitting. When lying down, he understands, I am lying down. Or he understands accordingly, however his body is disposed. In this way, he abides contemplating the body, in the body, internally, externally, and both internally and externally, etc. And he abides independent, not clinging to anything in the world. That too is how a monk abides contemplating the body in the body. Now this one refers to the four postures. Uh, these four postures, uh, generally if you are aware of the body postures, uh, it is uh, in the suttas, uh, it's generally called sampajanya. The Buddha uh, talks about sati, sampajanya. We have to practice both. Uh. Sati is recollecting the four objects of Sati. Sampajaniya is general mindfulness. General mindfulness. Whatever your body is doing, you are aware. If you are walking, you are aware you are walking. If you are changing your clothes, you are aware you are changing your clothes. If you are eating, you are aware you are eating. Why is Sampajaniya practice? Because Sampajaniya, if you are aware of our body, then our mind does not run away. We are practicing the holy path uh, to destroy the asavas. Asavas are uncontrolled mental outflows, uh, uh, the mind uh, leaking. So when the mind, uh, when the mind flows, uh, when the asavas flow, uh, then uh, our mind starts thinking here, think, running here, running there. Uh, we are not aware of our body. Uh, we are not aware of whatever we are doing. Uh, our mind is straying to the office or straying to the family or straying to our problems and all that. Uh. So as long as you are aware of your body, uh, the mind does not run away. La. So it helps to keep your mind focused. La. It helps to prevent, uh, Sampajaniya helps to prevent the mind from uh, flowing uh, carelessly. Mm. So in that way, uh, it helps us uh, to keep our mind focused. Again, monks. A monk is one who acts in full awareness when going forward and returning who acts in full awareness when looking ahead and looking away, who acts in full awareness when flexing and extending his limbs, who acts in full awareness when wearing his robes and carrying his outer bowl and robe, who acts in full awareness when eating, drinking, consuming food and tasting, who acts in full awareness when defecating and urinating, who acts in full awareness when walking, standing, sitting, falling asleep, waking up, talking and keeping silent, in this way, he abides contemplating the body in the body, internally, externally, and both internally and externally, etc. Yeah. So this one actually is Sampajaniya. This one being aware of all the body actions. Eh? Just now the previous one was just referring to the four postures, la, most specific. Eh? This one is general awareness of the body. Eh? Uh, so this is Sampajaniya. The fourth one, uh, again monks, a monk reviews the same body up from the soles of the feet and down from the top of the hair, bounded by, <coughs> bounded by skin, as full of many kinds of impurity thus. In this body there are head hairs, body hairs, hairs nails, teeth, skin, flesh, sinews, bones, bone, marrow, kidney, heart, liver, diaphragm, spleen, lungs, large intestines, small intestines, contents of the stomach, Feces, there should be a brain there missing, or oh, maybe they put the brain at the end. Bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears, grease, spittle, snot, all of the joints, urine. Mm. Just as though there were a bag with an opening at both ends, full of many, kind, many sorts of grain, such as hill rice, red rice, beans, peas, millet and white rice, and a man with good eyes were to open it and review it thus. This is hill rice, this is red rice, these are beans, these are peas, this is millet, this is white rice. So too, a monk reviews this same body as full of many kinds of impurity thus. In this body there are head hairs, body hairs, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, sinews, bones, etc. In this way, he abides contemplating the body in the body, internally, externally, and both internally and externally. And he abides independent, not clinging to anything in the world. 
That too is how a monk abides contemplating the body in the body. Let's stop here for a moment. Huh? This uh, meditation on the 32 parts of the body uh, that we just went through, uh, this was the first meditation taught by the Buddha. Uh, and if you practice this, uh, then you will notice uh, that the a body uh, is not as attractive uh, as we used to think. Uh, if you don't uh, practice this type of meditation, you see the body on its skin deep, uh, see the outer uh, looks of the body, uh, so uh, enticing, uh, so attractive. Uh, but when you consider all that is inside the body, then even Miss Universe uh, doesn't look so attractive anymore. <laughs> Again, monks, a monk reviews the same body, however it is placed, however disposed, as consisting of elements thus. In this body, there are the earth element, the water element, the fire element, and the air or wind element. Just as though a skilled butcher or his apprentice had killed a cow and was seated at the crossroads with it cut up into pieces, so too a monk reviews the same body as consisting of elements thus. In this body, the, there are the earth element, water element, fire element, the air element. In this, in this way, he abides contemplating the body in the body, internally, externally, and both internally and externally. And he abides independent, not clinging to anything in the world. That too is how a monk abides contemplating the body in the body. So this is another way of contemplating the body yeah, as consisting of the four elements, yeah. The four elements are supposed to be uh, the physical, the physical uh, body or the physical world. And these four elements uh, are not, uh, when you refer to the earth element, uh, it's not really the earth element. It refers to the hardness, the, the characteristic of hardness. Uh, anything that is hard uh, is called the earth element. The water element refers to the property of cohesion, when there's liquid, uh, it tends to cohere together. Uh, so that refers to, to the water element. The fire element is the heat element, and the air or wind element uh, is the element uh, that causes motion, movement. Uh, so the anything in the world, uh, in the physical world, uh, that has any one of these characteristics uh, are referred by these uh, four characteristics. Uh, mm. Again, monks, as though he were to see a corpse thrown aside in a charnel ground, one, two, or three days dead, bloated, livid, and oozing matter. A monk compares this same body with it thus. This body, too, is of the same nature. It will be like that. It is not exempt from that fate. Mm. So this uh, corpse contemplation is very good. Uh, if you look at a dead corpse, uh, it's three days dead. Uh. Uh, it is uh, oozing liquid uh, from the nine holes uh, and it's smelly and it's blue black and all that. Uh. So it's uh, repulsive, uh. repulsive to see, repulsive to smell. Uh. But when you consider uh, one day uh, our body also will be like that. Uh. Uh, no need to be so vain about our body. Uh. Uh, now we think it's so beautiful or so handsome. Uh. Mm, especially when we are young, but one day eh, it will be like that. Uh, rotten corpse, uh, smelly, eh, nobody wants. Eh. In this way, he abides contemplating the body in the body, internally, externally, and both internally and externally, etc. And he abides independent, not clinging to anything in the world. That too is how a monk abides contemplating the body in the body. Again, as though he were to see a corpse thrown aside in a charnel ground, being devoured by crows, hawks, vultures, dogs, jackals, or various kinds of worms. A monk compares this same body with it thus. This body too is of the same nature. It will be like that. It is not exempt from that fate. That too is how a monk abides contemplating the body in the body. Again, as though he were to see a corpse thrown aside in a charnel ground, a skeleton with flesh and blood held together with sinews, or a fleshless skeleton smeared with blood held together with sinews, or later a skeleton without flesh and blood held together with sinews, and later disconnected bones scattered in all directions, 
Here a hand bone, there a foot bone. Here a shin bone, there a thigh bone. Here a hip bone, there a back bone. Here a rib bone, there a breast bone. Here an arm bone, there a shoulder bone. Here a neck bone, there a jaw bone. Here a tooth, there the skull. A monk compares this same body with it thus. This body too is of the same nature. It will be like that. It is not exempt from that fate. That too is how a monk abides contemplating the body in the body. Again, as though he were to see a corpse thrown aside in a charnel ground, bones bleached white, the color of shells, or later bones heaped up more than a year old, and later bones rotted and crumbled to dust. A monk compares this same body with it thus. This body too is of the same nature. It will be like that. It is not exempt from that fate. Mm. So this uh, contemplation uh, is of the different types of corpse uh, at the various stages of decay. Uh, mm. uh, initially it's three days, two or three days old. Uh, it's bloated. Uh, Mm, I don't know whether you all have noticed uh, a dead dog or a dead cow by the roadside uh, or a dead buffalo. Uh, uh, after a few days, you see it's bloated uh, and, and uh, that's, there's a lot of air inside there, I think. Uh, so it seems to be like a balloon uh, bloated up. Uh, it's so tight uh, the the four legs are all stretched in different directions. Uh, uh, and then after another one or two more days, you see uh, it's collapsed already. Uh, collapse and the liquid is flowing out. It's full of worms. Uh, uh, full of worms. All the worms are eating the flesh. Uh. Then later, uh, uh, you find it's very smelly. Sometimes the dog also will go and eat something. Uh. And later you find di different stages of decay. Uh. So, uh, in the Buddha's days, uh, they have this charnel ground uh, where they throw the body in the forest. Uh in the body for it to, to rot, for the animals to eat. So the, the monk who's very serious, he will go and sit at the charnel ground and contemplate. I see this the various stages of decay of the corpse. So it's quite a sobering contemplation. In this way, he abides contemplating the body in the body internally, or he abides contemplating the body in the body externally, or he abides contemplating the body in the body both internally and externally, or else he abides contemplating in the body its arising factors, or he abides contemplating in the body its vanishing factors, or he abides contemplating in the body both its arising and vanishing factors. Or else mindfulness that there is a body is simply established in him to the extent necessary for bare knowledge and mindfulness and recollection. And he abides independent, not clinging to anything in the world. That too is how a monk abides contemplating the body in the body. And this contemplation of the corpse uh, brings to mind, uh, you know, the Taj Mahal. Taj Mahal, uh, we had this uh, emperor in India. Uh, I guess he had many wives. Uh, but one was his favorite wife, uh, must have been very young and beautiful. Uh, and this young and beautiful wife passed away. Uh, and he was so sad, uh, he wanted to preserve the body. Uh, he clung onto the body, but you know, uh, after a few days, he starts to get smelly. <laughs> Cannot continue to cling to it. Uh, so he built uh, this mausoleum, uh, this uh, Taj Mahal, uh, to store that corpse. Uh, uh, Nowadays, uh, if someone were, were in his position, uh, what would they do? They in inject it with anesthetics, uh, hoping that in a uh, few hundred years' time, uh, can revive. <laughs> uh, people don't, uh, cannot uh, accept anicca. A lot of people, uh, we know the world is impermanent, uh, but we cannot accept. <laughs> and how monks, does a monk abide contemplating feelings? in feelings. Here when feeling a pleasant feeling, a monk understands, I feel a pleasant feeling. When feeling a painful feeling, he understands, I feel a painful feeling. When feeling a neither painful nor pleasant feeling, he understands, I feel a neither painful nor pleasant feeling. When feeling a worldly 
pleasant feeling, he understands, I feel a worldly pleasant feeling. When feeling an unworldly pleasant feeling, he understands, I feel an unworldly pleasant feeling. When feeling a worldly painful feeling, he understands, I feel a worldly painful feeling. When feeling an unworldly painful feeling, he understands, I feel an unworldly painful feeling. When feeling a worldly neither painful nor pleasant feeling, he understands, I feel a worldly neither painful nor pleasant feeling. When feeling an unworldly neither painful nor pleasant feeling, he understands, I feel an unworldly neither painful nor pleasant feeling. This worldly and unworldly, yeah? the other day when we were reading the uh, Sangyuta Nikaya, Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi has changed his translation from here, worldly yeah, to unworldly. Yeah? He changed to, uh, if I remember correctly, carnal. You remember the carnal delight, carnal rapture, carnal and spiritual. Carnal and spiritual. In other words, the body, the body uh, feeling and the <clears throat> spiritual, I guess, could be the mental. In this way, he abides contemplating feelings in feelings internally. Or he abides contemplating feelings in feelings externally. Or he abides contemplating feelings as in feelings both internally and externally. Or else he abides contemplating in feelings their arising factors. Or he, arri or he abides contemplating in feelings their vanishing factors. Or he abides contemplating in feelings both their arising and vanishing factors. Or else mindfulness that there is feeling is simply established in him to the extent necessary for bare knowledge and recollection. And he abides independent, not clinging to anything in the world. That is how a monk abides contemplating feelings in feelings. Uh, so when you contemplate feelings, uh, whatever type of feeling arises, uh, you, know, you know that it is uh, such a feeling. You should also understand uh, that it is impermanent. So because it is impermanent, I uh, don't cling to it. Uh, uh, so, even if uh, like an uh, angry feeling arises, uh, we know it's just an uh, unwholesome state of mind. Uh, we just wait for it to subside. Uh, and then if you have an enjoyable feeling arising, uh, then we should know, uh, even though it's so enjoyable, uh, don't cling to it, uh, because very soon it will go away. If you cling to it, it will give you a lot of dukkha. Uh, uh. That's why the Buddha says uh, all feelings uh, are basically intrinsically dukkha. La. Even pleasant feelings are also dukkha intrinsically la, because very soon when they go away, yeah, it turns from pleasant to unpleasant. Mm. And how monks does a monk abide contemplating mind in mind? Here a monk understands mind affected by lust as mind affected by lust and mind unaffected by lust as mind unaffected by lust. He understands mind affected by hatred as a mind affected by hatred, and a mind unaffected by hatred as a mind unaffected by hatred. He understands a mind affected by delusion as a mind affected by delusion, and a mind unaffected by delusion as a mind unaffected by delusion. He understands a contracted mind as a contracted mind, and a distracted mind as a distracted mind. Let's stop here for a moment. Huh? If you remember, huh? The Sangyutta Nikaya Suttas, uh, we studied, uh, a contracted mind uh, means a mind uh, that is overcome by sloth and topper. When you have sloth and topper, that uh, refers to a contracted mind. A distracted mind is a mind uh, that is distracted out to the six sense objects, uh, to seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touch and thinking. He understands an exalted mind as an exalted mind, an unexalted mind as an unexalted mind. He understands a surpassed mind as a surpassed mind, and an unsurpassed mind as an unsurpassed mind. He understands a concentrated mind as a concentrated mind, and an unconcentrated mind as an unconcentrated mind. He understands a liberated mind as a liberated mind, and an unliberated mind as an unliberated mind. In this way, he abides contemplating mind in mind internally, or he abides contemplating mind in mind externally, or he abides contemplating mind in mind, both internally and externally. Or else he abides contemplating in mind its arising factors. Or he abides contemplating in mind its vanishing factors. 
or here by contemplating in mind both its arising and vanishing factors. Or else mindfulness that there is mind is simply established in him to the extent necessary for bare knowledge and recollection, and hereby is independent, not clinging to anything in the world. That is how among among abides contemplating mind as mind. Contemplation, contemplation of dhammas. Now we come to contemplation of dhammas. Here it says mind objects. Uh, you know, that's a wrong translation because of the four objects of sati uh, or satipatthana. This last one, uh, the dhamma, is the most important because there's this one sutta where the Buddha says uh, uh, a person becomes liberated uh, only under five circumstances. Uh, there are only five occasions uh, when a monk becomes liberated, attains arahanhood. One is when he listens to the Dhamma, he understands uh, and becomes liberated. The second one, when he's teaching the Dhamma. Third one, when he's repeating the Dhamma. The fourth, when he's reflecting on the Dhamma. And only the fifth uh, is during meditation, when he contemplates on the Samadhi Nimitta. Uh, so you see, out of these five occasions, uh, four of them uh, have to do with Dhamma. Uh, and four of them actually have to do with contemplation of Dhamma. Uh, because even when you repeat the Dhamma, you are contemplating. Uh, because when you repeat the Dhamma, you are uh, repeating it uh, in a language you understand. So as soon as you understand the words, uh, you start to digest it. Uh, that is vipassana, contemplation. Mm. So when you listen to the Dhamma, that is vipassana, that is contemplation. Mm. When you teach the Dhamma, you also have to contemplate the Dhamma before you can uh, speak the Dhamma. Uh, that again is vipassana, that is contemplation. When you repeat the Dhamma, that is also vipassana, contemplation. When you reflect on the Dhamma, that is also vipassana, contemplation. Uh, so the samatha part uh, is the meditation part. And the uh, vipassana is n n actually not nothing to do with meditation. Uh, it is just contemplation of the Dhamma. So here this last object of sati or satipatthana, it's not mind objects, but it's the Dhamma, the Buddha's Dhamma. And how monks does a monk abide contemplating Dhamma in Dhamma? Here a monk abides contemplating Dhamma in Dhamma in terms of the five hindrances. And how does a monk abide contemplating Dhamma in Dhamma in terms of the five hindrances? Here there being sensual desire in him, a monk understands there is sensual desire in me. Or there being no sensual desire in him, he understands there is no sensual desire in me. And he also, also understands how there comes to be the arising of unarisen sensual desire. And how there comes to be the abandoning of arisen sensual desire. And how there comes to be the future non-arising of abandoned sensual desire. Similarly, there being ill will in him, sloth and torpor, restlessness and remorse, doubt, and so a uh, monk understands, there is this hindrance in me, or there being no hindrance in him, he understands there is no hindrance in me. And he un understands how there comes to be a rising of the hindrance, and how there comes to be abandoning of the hindrance, and how there comes to be the future non-arising of the abandoned hindrance. In this way, he abides contemplating Dhamma in Dhamma internally, or he abides contemplating Dhamma in Dhamma externally, or he abides contemplating Dhamma in Dhamma, both internally and externally, or else he abides contemplating uh, in Dhamma the arising factors, or he abides contemplating in Dhamma the vanishing factors, or he abides contemplating in Dhamma both the arising and vanishing factors, or else mindfulness that there is Dhamma is simply established in him to the extent necessary for bare knowledge and a collection, and he abides independent, not clinging to anything in the world. That is how a monk abides contemplating Dhamma in Dhamma in terms of the five hindrances. Again, monks, a monk abides contemplating Dhamma in Dhamma in terms of the five aggregates of attachment. And how does a monk abide contemplating Dhamma in Dhamma in terms of the five aggregates of attachment? Here, a monk understands such is material form or body such its origin, such its disappearance, such its feeling, such its origin, such its disappearance, such its perception, such its origin, such its disappearance, such its volition, such its origin, such its disappearance, such its consciousness, such its origin, such its disappearance. 
In this way, he abides contemplating Dhamma in Dhamma, internally, externally, etc. These five aggregates uh, refers to five things, uh, body, feelings, perception, volition, and consciousness. Uh, and these five things can be also considered to be two things, uh, body and mind. Mind consisting of the four things, uh, uh, feelings, perception, volition, and consciousness. Uh, uh. Again, monks, a monk abides contemplating Dhamma in Dhamma in terms of the six internal and external bases. And how does a monk abide contemplating Dhamma in Dhamma in terms of the six internal and external bases? Here, a monk understands the I, he understands forms, he understands the factor that arises dependent on both. And he also understands how there comes to be the arising of the unarisen factor, and how there comes to be the abandoning of the arisen factor and how there comes to be the future non-arising of the abandoned factor. Similarly, he understands the ear, uh, he understands the nose, the tongue, uh, the body, the mind, he understands uh, the, uh, the six spaces uh, and the uh, objects uh, and the factor that arises. Uh, in this way, he abides contemplating Dhamma in Dhamma, internally, externally, etc. The six bases uh, uh, refers to the six sense bases of eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. Uh, and the objects, uh, uh, the object of eyes forms, uh, the object of ear is sounds, uh, etc. So, um, the factor that arises uh, is the craving. The craving, when you see something beautiful, uh, you crave for it. Uh, that is the factor. Uh, and when you hear some nice sounds, uh, you also uh, attach to it. Uh, that is again the factor. Uh, similarly, for smells, taste, etc. Again, monks. A monk abides contemplating Dhamma in Dhamma in terms of the seven enlightenment factors, Bojangas. And how does a monk abide contemplating Dhamma in Dhamma in terms of the seven enlightenment factors? Here, there being the uh, mindfulness or recollection enlightenment factor in him, the monk understands there is the mindfulness or recollection enlightenment factor in me. Or there being no sati enlightenment factor in him, he understands there is no sati enlightenment factor in him. And he also understands that how, how there comes to be the arising of the unarisen sati enlightenment factor and how the arisen sati enlightenment factor comes to fulfillment by development. There being the investigation of dhamma enlightenment factor, dhamma vichaya. Uh, similarly, there being the energy enlightenment factor, there being the delight piti enlightenment factor, there being the tranquility pasadi enlightenment factor, there being the concentration samadhi enlightenment factor, there being the equanimity upeka enlightenment factor. He understands uh, that there is the enlightenment factor in me, or and there is no. He understands there is no enlightenment factor, uh, how they arise, etc. In this way, uh, by contemplating mind in mind, uh, etc. Yeah, contemplating this uh, dhamma in dhamma, etc. So these enlightenment factors, uh, seven of them, uh, are very important factors uh, for enlightenment. And we went through the whole. Sangyutta on the Bojangas eh, a few days ago. Again, monks, a monk abides contemplating Dhamma in Dhamma in terms of the four noble truths. And how does a monk abide contemplating Dhamma in Dhamma in terms of the four noble truths? Here, a monk understands as it actually is, this is suffering. He understands as it actually is, this is the origin of suffering. And he understands as it actually is, this is the cessation of suffering. He understands as it actually is, this is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. In this way, he abides contemplating Dhamma in Dhamma internally, or he abides contemplating Dhamma in Dhamma externally, etc. This here, you look, notice here, this description of the Four Noble Truths is very short. So this Sutta, this, this Satipatthana Sutta, differs from the Maha Satipatthana Sutta found in the Diga Nikaya, only here, in the Maha Satipatthana Sutta, they explain the Four Noble Truths in greater detail. Otherwise, the rest of the Sutta is exactly the same between the Satipatthana Sutta found in the Majjhima Nikaya 
and the Maha Satipatthana Sutta found in the Diga Nikaya. In the Diga Nikaya, when they explain the Four Noble Truths in detail, eh, they explain suffering, they explain the origin of suffering, the cessation of suffering, the path leading to the cessation of suffering. Eh. And then in the uh, Noble Eightfold Path, the uh, explanation of the Noble Eightfold Path, eh, when it comes to right concentration, eh, it is stated in the Maha Satipatthana Sutta that right concentration refers to the four jhanas. To the four jhanas. Eh. Everywhere in the suttas, when the Buddha talks about right concentration or perfect concentration, he always refers to the four jhanas. But nowadays, people misinterpret and say that concentration can refer to momentary concentration, kanika samadhi. This word kanika samadhi, the Buddha never heard it also, never used it. So it is something that developed later. In the Buddha's teachings, uh, samadhi always refers to the jhanas. Monks, if anyone should develop these four satipatthanas uh, in ten states of recollection uh, in such a way for seven years, one of two fruits could be expected of for him, either final knowledge here and now, or that if there is a trace of clinging left, non-return. Let alone seven years, monks, if anyone should develop these four intense states of recollection in such a way for six years or for five years, four years, three years, two years, one year, one of two fruits could be expected for him, either final knowledge here and now, or if there is a trace of clinging left, non-return. Let alone one year monks, if anyone should develop these four intense states of recollection in such a way for seven months, for six months, five months, four months, three months, two months, one month, for half a month, one of two fruits could be expected for him, either final knowledge here and now, or if a, there is a trace of clinging left, non-return. Let alone half a month, monks, if anyone should develop these four intense states of recollection in such a way, for seven days, one of two fruits could be expected for him, either final knowledge here and now, or if there is a trace of clinging left, non-return. So it was with reference to this that it was said, monks, this is the direct path, or this is the path leading one way only for the purification of beings, for the surmounting of sorrow and lamentation, for the disappearance of pain and grief, for the attainment of the true way, for the realization of Nibbana, namely the four intense states of recollection. That is what the Blessed One said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So in this last part, now, the Buddha says, uh, if a monk practices the four satipatthanas uh, correctly uh, even for seven days uh, in seven days time uh, he can become liberated become enlightened mm. so that can only happen uh, if the uh, sati uh, is unremitting san sati uh, every second uh, the mindfulness uh, does not uh, uh, stray, uh, does not weaken, does not run away. Uh, so that's why it's called intense state of recollection. So intense uh, that it is not, uh, there's no let up. Uh, so in the, uh, our Buddha, among our Buddha's disciples, uh, we know of only one, uh, Venerable Maha Moggallana, who attained uh, liberation in seven days. He practiced uh, seven days. Uh, he's, he practiced strenuously uh, for seven days uh, and he became enlightened in, in, in such a short time. Uh. But that was possible only with the help of the Buddha. Because I mentioned in the Sangyutta Nikaya that we read, uh, when, he, when he entered in the first jhana, uh, because he was practicing so hard, uh, he, didn't, he, didn't take, he didn't take rest, you see. So he was so sleepy uh, that uh, he fell out of the first jhana. When that happened, the Buddha came to him. Uh, came to him and, and asked him uh, to, to be more mindful, uh, uh, don't be nodding. Uh, uh. Then he knew that the Buddha was uh, observing him, uh, uh, then used more energy and he, he could stay in the first jhana. And after that, uh, he could enter the second jhana. But because of so, the same reason, uh, he was so tired uh, that uh, he was uh, nodding his head uh, and coming out of the second jhana. Again, the Buddha went to him uh, and uh, 
uh, reminded him uh, and again uh, he used more effort uh, and could abide steady in the second jhana after that similarly for the third jhana fourth jhana and the other jhanas uh, until uh, uh, his mindfulness uh, was unremitting uh, no let up in his mindfulness uh, no sleep uh, for seven days and nights uh, no sleep until he became enlightened mm. Uh, so nowadays, uh, the, what is being practiced now, uh, without the samadhi, uh, it's impossible uh, to become enlightened uh, in seven days. Uh, not to say seven days, uh, even seven years or uh, seventy years, uh, without the strong samadhi, you cannot become enlightened at all. Mm. Recapitulate, uh, uh, recap what the Buddha said on the Satipatthana Sutta. This Satipatthana Sutta, uh, it doesn't teach you exactly uh, how to practice sati, you know, it just tells you the objects objects of sati uh, that uh, contemplating the body is firstly he says uh, to practice satipatthana you got to contemplate four things uh, body feelings mind and dhamma and then the first one the uh, body yeah uh, he tells you the various types of bodies that you can contemplate uh, first one is the breath body then after that the four postures then after that uh, awareness uh, awareness actually is sampajanya uh, awareness of your body actions uh, and number four is the uh, unattractiveness of the body and the 32 parts of the body. And then after that, the four elements. The fifth uh, is the four elements. And then the sixth to the fourteenth object uh, is the skeleton contemplation, the different types of skeleton. Uh, so there are 14 uh, objects uh, in the body. Then contemplation of feelings, uh, there's only one. Uh, Whenever feelings arise and cease, uh, you have to be mindful of it. Then uh. contemplating of mind, uh, the state of the mind, uh, whether it's a lustful, lustful mind or an angry mind or whatever, uh, just um, be aware of it. Uh. I think uh, this contemplation of mind, uh, you can include uh, also the thoughts, uh, whatever thoughts arise, uh, you have to be aware. Uh. But instead of following the thoughts, uh, you, you don't follow the thoughts. If you follow the thoughts, uh, you keep thinking, uh, then you are no more mindful. Uh. Instead, uh, you have to observe uh, why you think in a certain way. Uh. What is your motive? Uh. When we look at the motive uh, uh, behind our thoughts, behind our reactions, uh, uh, then we understand ourselves better. Uh, whether we have a, a big fat ego or we have a lot of anger or whatever. Uh, uh, we have a lot of greed. Uh, uh. So, it's only by understanding yourself uh, that you can change. La. If you don't understand yourself, how can you change? How can you improve? Uh, that's why uh, in the um, Noble Eightfold Path, uh, the sixth factor, right effort. Right effort uh, is to always observe uh, whether you have unwholesome states of mind or wholesome states of mind. Uh, so, uh, in the same way, uh, so when whatever thoughts come to your mind also, uh, you should understand whether they are wholesome or unwholesome. And the contemplation of dhammas uh, is to uh, contemplate those dhammas uh, that are very important in the Buddha's teachings. Uh, first one is the five hindrances, uh, how the five hindrances uh, uh, hinder us uh, from having wisdom. Uh, so we should try to get rid of them uh, by meditation. And the five aggregates of attachment, this is an extremely important topic. Uh, uh, they found in the Kanda Sangyuta, the Sangyuta Nikaya. Then the six bases, uh, the six bases is the Salayatana Sangyuta in the Sangyuta Nikaya. And then the seven enlightenment factors is the Bojanga Sangyuta in the Sangyuta Nikaya. And then the four noble truths uh, is the Satcha Sangyuta in the Sangyuta Nikaya. Uh, so, the Sangyuta Nikaya is a very, very important, uh, to me, the most important Nikaya. It tells you exactly how to practice Satipatthana, how to practice the seven Bojangas, etc. Uh, whereas this Sutta, this Satipatthana Sutta, just tells you the objects of Sati. It doesn't explain uh, ex exactly what is the meaning of Sati or Satipatthana and how to practice uh, Okay, let's try to go through the 11th Sutta, Chula Sihanada.
Sutta, the shorter discourse on the lion's roar. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jeta's Grove, another up in Dika's Park. There he addressed the monks thus, Monks, Honorable Sir, they replied. The Blessed One said, Monks, only here is there a recluse, a Samana, I think. Only here a second recluse, only here a third recluse, only here a fourth recluse. The doctrines of others are devoid of recluses. That is how you should rightly roar your lion's roar. So here the Buddha is saying, uh, only in the Buddha's teachings, uh, in the Buddha sasana, uh, you have the first, second and third recluse, uh, the, 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 the first, second and third real monk. Uh. I suppose he says, first, here, first, second, third and fourth, uh, maybe refers to the four types of, uh, the four types of fruits, of fruitions, uh, the Sotapanna, Sakadagamin, Anagamin, and Arahana. It is possible, monks, that wanderers of other sects might ask, but on the strength of what argument or with the support of what authority do the Venerable Ones say thus? Wanderers of other sects who ask thus may be answered in this way. Friends, four things have been declared to us by the Blessed One who knows and sees, accomplished and fully enlightened. This is Arahan Samasam Buddha. On seeing these in ourselves, we say, only here is there a recluse, only here a second recluse, only here a third recluse, only here a fourth recluse. The doctrines of others are devoid of recluses. What are the four? We have confidence in the teacher, that means the Buddha. We have confidence in the Dhamma. We have fulfilled the precepts. And our companions in the Dhamma are dear and agreeable to us, whether they are laymen or those gone forth. These are the four things declared to us by the Blessed One who knows and sees, accomplished and fully enlightened, on seeing which in ourselves we say as we do. So the Buddha says, uh, there are four things uh, that they possess. Uh, they, they, they have confidence in the Buddha, the, the Dhamma, and they keep the Aryan precepts and the companions um, in the Dhamma are dear to them. Now. It is possible, monks, that wanderers of other sects might say thus, Friends, we too have confidence in the teacher, that is, in our teacher. We too have confidence in the Dhamma, that is, in our Dhamma. We too have fulfilled the precepts, that is, our precepts. And our companions in the Dhamma are dear and agreeable to us too, whether they are laymen or those gone forth. What is the distinction here, friends? What is the variance? What is the difference between you and us? Wonders of other sects who ask us may be answered in this way. How then, friends, is the goal one or many? I mean, is, is the object one or many? Nah? Answering rightly, the wonders of other sects would answer thus. Friends, the goal is one, not many. But friends, is that goal for one affected by lust or free from lust? Answering rightly, the wonders of other sects would answer thus, Friends, that goal is one for the goal is for one free from lust, not for one affected by lust. But friends, is that goal for one affected by hate or free from hate? Answering rightly, they would answer, Friends, that goal is for one free from hate, not for one affected by hate. But friends, is that goal for one affected by delusion or free from delusion? Answering rightly, they would answer, Friends, that goal is for one free from delusion, not for one affected by delusion. But friends, is that goal for one affected by craving or free from craving? Answering rightly, they would answer, Friends, that goal is, one, is for one free from craving, not for one affected by craving. But friends, is that goal for one affected by clinging attachment or free from clinging? Answering rightly, they would answer, Friends, that goal is for one free from clinging, not for one affected by clinging. But friends, is that goal for one who has vision or for one without vision? Answering rightly, they would answer, Friends, that goal is for one with vision, not for one without vision. But friends, is that goal for one who favours and opposes, or for one who does not favour and oppose? Answering rightly, they would answer, Friends, that goal is for one who does not favor and oppose, not for one who favors and opposes. But friends, is that goal for one who delights in and enjoys proliferation, or for one who does not delight in and enjoy proliferation? 
answering rightly, they would answer, Friends, that goal is for one who does not delight in and enjoy proliferation, not for one who delights in and enjoys proliferation. Here, proliferation uh, is papancha, uh, means proliferation of thoughts. Uh. Monks, there are these two views, the view of being and the view of non-being. Any recluses or Brahmins who rely on the view of being, adopt the view of being, accept the view of being, are opposed to the view of non-being. Any recluses or Brahmins who rely on the view of non-being, adopt the view of non-being, accept the view of non-being, are opposed to the view of being. Any recluses or Brahmins who do not understand as they actually are, the origin, the disappearance, the gratification, the danger and the escape, in the case of these two views, are affected by lust, hatred, delusion, affected by craving, clinging, uh, without vision, given to favoring and opposing, and they delight in and enjoy proliferation. They are not free from birth, aging and death, from sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair. They are not free from suffering, I say. Any recluses or Brahmins who understand as they actually are, the origin, the disappearance, the gratification, the danger, and the escape, in the case of these two views, are without lust, without hate, without delusion, without craving, clinging, with vision, not given to favoring and opposing, and they do not delight in and enjoy proliferation. They are freed from birth, aging, and death, from sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. They are freed from suffering, I say. Monks, there are these four kinds of clinging. What for? Clinging to sensual pleasures, clinging to views, clinging to rules and observances, and clinging to a doctrine of a self. Though certain recluses and Brahmins claim to propound the full understanding of all kinds of clinging, they do not completely describe the full understanding of all kinds of clinging. They describe the full understanding of clinging to sensual pleasures without describing the full understanding of clinging to views, clinging to rules and observances, and clinging to a doctrine of self. Why is that? Those good recluses and Brahmins do not understand these three instances of clinging as they actually are. Therefore, though they claim to propound the full understanding of all kinds of clinging, they describe only the full understanding of clinging to sensual pleasures without describing the full understanding of clinging to views, clinging to rules and observances, and clinging to a doctrine of self. Though certain recluses and Brahmins claim to propound the, the full understanding of all kinds of clinging, they describe the full understanding of clinging to sensual pleasures and clinging to views without describing the full understanding of clinging to rules and observances and clinging to a doctrine of self. Why is that? They do not understand the two instances. Therefore, they describe only the full understanding of clinging to sensual pleasures and views. Though certain recluses and Brahmins claim to propound the full understanding of all kinds of clinging, they describe the full understanding of clinging to sensual pleasures, clinging to views, and clinging to rules and observances without describing the full understanding of clinging to the, to the doctrine of self. Because in such monks, in such a Dhamma Vinaya as that, it is plain that confidence in the teacher is not rightly directed that confidence in the Dhamma is not rightly directed, that fulfillment of the precepts is not rightly directed, and that the affection among companions in the holy life is not, directly, is not rightly directed. Why is that? Because that is how it is when the Dhamma Vinaya is badly proclaimed and badly expounded, unemancipating, unconducive to peace, expounded by one who is not fully enlightened, monks, when a Tathagata, Arahan Samasambuddha, claims to propound the full understanding of all kinds of clinging, he completely describes the full understanding of all kinds of clinging. He describes the full understanding of clinging to sensual pleasures, views, rules and observances, and to a doctrine of self. Monks, in such a Dhamma Vinaya as that, it is plain that confidence in the teacher is rightly directed, that confidence in the Dhamma is rightly directed, that fulfillment of the precepts is rightly directed, and that the affection among companions in the Dhamma is rightly directed. Why is that? Because that is how it is when the Dhamma Vinaya is well proclaimed and well expounded, emancipating, conducive to peace, expounded by one who is fully enlightened. Now these four kinds of clinging, 
have what as their source, what as their origin, from what are they born and produced. These four kinds of clinging have craving as their source, craving as their origin. They are born and produced from craving. Craving has what as its source, craving has feeling as its source, feeling has what as its source, feeling has contact as its source, contact has what as its source, contact has the sixfold base as its source, the sixfold base has what has what as its source, the sixfold base has nama rupa, mentality, materiality as its source, mentality, materiality has what as its source. Mentality, materiality has consciousness as its source. Consciousness has what as its source. Consciousness has volition as its source. Volition has what as its source. Volition has ignorance as its source. Ignorance as its origin. It is born and produced from ignorance. Monks, when ignorance is abandoned and true knowledge has arisen in a monk, then with the fading away of ignorance and the arising of true knowledge, he no longer clings to sensual pleasures, no longer clings to views, no longer clings to rules and observances, no longer, longer clings to a doctrine of a self. When he does not cling, he is not agitated. When he is not agitated, he personally attains Nibbana. He understands birth is destroyed, the holy life has been lived, what had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. That is what the Blessed One said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So in this sutta, the Buddha says uh, that uh, the real recluse uh, or the real uh, monk uh, is only found in the Buddha's Dhamma Vinaya, in the Buddha's teachings. Uh, and then if the external ascetics say uh, that uh, they also are similar, uh, then uh, the Buddha says, uh, but the Dhamma Vinaya is different. So even these four things uh, that they claim to have uh, confidence in the teacher, confidence in the Dhamma, they have the precepts and they love their companions in the holy life. Uh, even that is faulty uh, because the Dhamma Vinaya is faulty. Uh. Then the Buddha says, uh, talks about the four kinds of attachment or clinging, clinging to sensual pleasures, clinging to views, clinging to rules and observances, and clinging to a doctrine of a self. The Buddha says, uh, these external sect ascetics, uh, they are not able to explain these four types of clinging uh, in detail. Uh, they might be able to explain one, or explain two, or explain three, uh, but they, they are not able to explain all four correctly uh, and in detail. Uh, And after that, the Buddha says, uh, clinging, uh, uh, the source of clinging is craving, uh, source of craving is feeling, uh, etc. Just like in the dependent origination uh, suttas. Uh, mm. So that's the end of the sutta for tonight. Uh, anything to discuss? of the fear huh, is our uh, I am, uh, the being. Once you have uh, perception uh, that the I exists, uh, then uh, you are always afraid uh, uh, that this I uh, uh, may be harmed in any way. Uh. That's why all our fears arise uh, because of that self. Uh. If there is no self, uh, then there is no fear. That's why the Buddha says, uh, an arahan, uh, because he has no self, uh, if you took a dagger, you wanted to stab an arahan, uh, he will not shout for help. Uh. Uh, he does not see a self in this body. Uh. Uh, even if you were to kill him, uh, he would accept it uh, as his karma. Uh. Mm-hmm. 
So you can switch on to uh, a suba or the two parts. On the other hand, if you compare it, I don't know if you can see it. So how, how are we going to balance in the day? You see, if you uh, practice meditation correctly, la, any, it doesn't matter what is your object na, uh, that you contemplate on, na, your meditation. Na. But the aim of meditation na, is to attain the jhanas, la, to attain one pointedness of mind, to attain a focused mind. Na. When the mind uh, attains samadhi, na, there is strength in the mind. Na. When there is strength in the mind, na, it doesn't move so easily. La. Uh, so it is not uh, so much affected by fear or by uh, sensual pleasures or enjoyment, anything. Uh, even dukkha, la, it is not so much affected uh, because it, is, it, is, uh, it has a firm foundation, uh, it has a firm base. La, uh. So samadhi is very important, uh, strength of mind. Uh. And understanding of the Dhamma also. La. If you have understanding of the Dhamma, then certain things uh, we can accept. La. Like seeing these corpses and all that. Uh, although they are revolting, uh, but uh, the only way to overcome it uh, is to see it again and again. Uh, you, 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 you cannot say, oh, because it's revolting, I don't want to see it. Maybe when my samadhi is strong, uh, then maybe I can see it. Don't wait. Nah. You have to start uh, getting used to it nah, by seeing it. Nah. The other day, uh, I understand they showed this uh, Asuba, this um, VCD, yeah, on how they kill people and all that. And then our, one of our brothers, after seeing that, he couldn't sleep for a few nights. And he ran away home, he went home for a few days uh, before he came back. Nah. So, um, you see, this, uh, although this thing uh, is revolting, uh, hard to see, uh, hard to stomach, uh, but it is it's a fact of life. Uh. The life is like that. Uh. Life is really very cruel. Uh. So we have to come to terms with it. Uh. Uh, we have to face it. Uh. I always like to quote this, uh, that when I was young, uh, I had this fear of the darkness uh, because uh, my parents brought me to see a Pontianak show, uh, ghost, ghost show. Uh. It was so frightening. Uh, that after I came back, every night I had a nightmare for seven nights. Uh, every night I woke up uh, sweating all over. And from there I got a fear of the dark. Now, after I became a monk and then I went to Thailand and I came back from Thailand in 1987, I went to look for caves to stay in Ipoh area. I looked and I looked I couldn't find a good cave. You know, all the good caves are taken up by people, to, by fortune tellers and by this and that. And all. So uh, some devotees went looking for me and they found this dark cave behind Simpang Polai. A very dark and huge cave, like, bigger, I think, bigger than this uh, hall. <laughs> uh, and uh, it seems during the Japanese occupation, uh, when the Second World War, uh, about 200 girls uh, hid in that, in that cave. Like, they were afraid uh, the, of being raped by the Japanese soldiers. So they hid in that cave. Like. So that was the best cave I, I had. So um, because it was very quiet, uh, I went to stay there. Uh, Oh, it's very frightening. I could <laughs> the first two, two nights I did not stay inside. Nah. I stayed outside. Nah. But then I had a dream nah, that made me, that told me nah, that I would be safe nah, if I went inside the cave. Nah. Some devas appeared to me in the dream. Nah. So after that I went to stay inside the cave. Nah. But it was so dark, nah. I had to light an oil lamp. Nah. Oil lamp. Mm. And sometimes some curious people came nah, looking for me. I just blow off the oil lamp. Nah. I stand behind the rock, uh, they look and look, they can't see anybody. <laughs> so dark. Uh. So from there, uh, I stayed there four months. Uh, slowly, I overcame the fear of darkness. Uh. Uh, so it's like this. Uh, you want to overcome some shortcoming in you. Uh, you have to face it head on. You cannot run away. You keep running away uh, until you die. Uh, so you never overcome your fear.
Yeah, I mean, uh, don't worry about your meditation not being up to standard. Uh. If you have, for example, a photo uh, of a cut-up corpse, uh, then once in a while you peep at it, uh, you're afraid, uh, you put it away. And you peep at it again, uh, you keep peeping until you get used to it. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Not, not, not necessary, la. Mm. But if you are a person with a lot of lust, uh, then it is advisable uh, to contemplate on the cops. Uh. Mm. You see, in the uh, Noble Eightfold Path, uh, the seventh factor is Samasati, right? Right recollection. The eighth factor is sama samadhi right concentration huh? now the seventh factor huh, is only sama sati it's not it's not satipatthana you know a lot of people huh, uh, think huh, that sati and satipatthana is the same it's different sati and satipatthana is different sati huh, is contemplating huh, these four things you can contemplate all four or you can contemplate one of them huh? uh, and you do this contemplation huh, whenever uh, whenever convenient, uh, for example, when you're sitting in a bus, as there's nothing to do, when you're taking a stroll, uh, you just reflect on the Dhamma and you think of these four objects. Uh, you observe your mind, observe your feelings, uh, and then uh, uh, remember the Dhamma that you have learned, and then observe your body and think of the nature of your body, how you're getting old, how five years ago you didn't have uh, arthritis, now you got arthritis here and there. Uh, so then you realize the nature of the body, you know? uh, and you contemplate, if you like, uh, on the corpse, how you're going to end up as a corpse uh, and all this. Uh, so that is sati. But sati patana is different. Sati patana, the example given in the Sangyutta Nikaya on how to practice sati patana was this uh, man uh, who was forced to carry a bowl of oil you know, among a great crowd of people and a man followed him behind uh, with an uplifted sword uh, and told him, uh, if you spill even one drop of the oil, uh, I'll chop off your head. So this man uh, holding the bowl of oil, uh, he has to be very mindful uh, that he does not spill uh, even one drop of oil. Uh, so he is walking uh, with all his attention uh, focused on that bowl of oil. Uh, that is how to practice Satipatthana. And it's also mentioned very clearly uh, in the Satipatthana Sangyutta uh, when the Buddha talked about the simile of the cook, uh, uh, that uh, the skillful monk uh, who practices Satipatthana, that means the one who practices Satipatthana in the correct way, uh, ends up uh, with getting concentration. Uh, uh, if he does not get concentration, uh, then uh, he's unskillful. He has not, op he has not uh, obtained uh, the objective uh, of practice satipatthana. The objective of practicing satipatthana is to attain the jhanas. That is the end result. Uh, so, satipatthana is the link uh, between samasati and samasamadhi. Uh, after you practice uh, sati already, uh, then you focus your attention on one one object, uh, for example, your breath. And as, 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 as much as you can, uh, put your attention on the breath, uh, the, that one object. Uh, like in the Buddha's, uh, for the Buddha's disciples, uh, they put their attention on the breath uh, 24 hours a day. Uh, even when they rest or so, uh, they have unremitting mindfulness on the breath uh, until they are able to maintain their mindfulness uh, 24 hours a day. Uh, then they attain Rahanhut. Uh, and then after that, uh, the, the Buddha says in the Vinaya books uh, that all Arahants uh, have mindfulness uh, 24 hours a day. That's why they cannot do anything wrong. They cannot commit any, any fault, uh, any, any, any break, any precept. Uh. So, uh, 
So for uh, Arahan uh, to be mindful 24 hours a day, uh, he must have practiced uh, to the extent uh, that he could maintain his mindfulness 24 hours. So you, you cannot do that, that type of practice, uh, maintain your unremitting mindfulness uh, without Samadhi. Uh, without Samadhi, uh, you try to be mindful, uh, very soon uh, you'll be falling asleep. <laughs> So that is a difference between sati and satipatthana. Satipatthana is the intense state of recollection uh, and remitting mindfulness on one object, uh, moment to moment to moment to moment, and only one object uh, uh, until uh, it turns into one pointedness of mind. Uh, that's why the Venerable Anuruddha he was asked, uh, "What did you practice uh, to great to attain such great super?" Supernormal powers, uh, and he said, Satipatthana, intense state of recollection. Mm. Say again. Yeah, but in this simile, uh, I see uh, that uh, uh, the cook has to observe the master's preference. La. So in the same way, when we are meditating, uh, we have to observe uh, what the mind inclines to, la. what the mind, like the type of meditation object that the mind likes, uh, uh, the type of conditions uh, that the mind likes, uh, like the place, the surroundings, the environment and all that. Uh. Ah, yes, 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 yes. You have to be very observant of yourself. Come, we end here.